Anti-Russian hysteria is at a new peak, with the political establishment and corporate media jointly accusing Russia of interfering in the recent U.S. election. While some politicians have gone so far as to treat the alleged hack as an act of war, this fear-mongering doesn't engage with the actual history of U.S.-Russia relations. Beyond just influencing elections in Russia, the U.S., along with Western capitalist institutions, set the stage for the entire political system they now condemn. To learn more about U.S. interference in Russia's political and economic affairs, I spoke with American journalist Mark Ames, who reported for nearly a decade in Boris Yeltsin's Moscow. Ames co-founded The Exile in 1998, an English-language newspaper critical of the Russian state. Putin's government shut it down in 2008. Ames remains a prominent author, journalist, and eminent voice on Russian politics. So you've said that you don't necessarily rule out Russia's role in the hack of Podesta and the DNC, but every time the establishment presents evidence, it feels like we're just being conned. Um, it's certainly plausible. Russia has motive, uh, which is everything we've done to that country since uh, <laughs> the late 1980s, which is, I mean, meddling in their democracy was putting it very mildly. We basically restructured their entire political economy and then and left it in a complete shambles. Um, and, then, and then we've meddled in other ways since then, you know, funding opposition groups and so on and so forth. So they certainly have the motive. Uh, there's, there's no ideological reason. I mean, Putin and the Kremlin, they're not, you know, Quakers. There's no reason why they wouldn't. They have the means. The reasons they wouldn't do it would be for practical reasons, right? Practically, it would create these kind of problems if they got caught and so on and so forth. What has really been strange to me has been the awful reporting and, um, and the atrocious intelligence reports, which have been, I, I don't know, I feel like, uh, well, you can't really describe it as anything but a sort of um, a disinformation campaign mm -hmm. on, on us, um, on, uh, you know, on the domestic public. Um, and the other thing is there, that Obama and the Democrats and the centrist Republicans who are pushing this story, they also have motive uh, which is to indemnify themselves from the fact that they have been completely rejected by, you know, by the public. They lost the elections. And they have the means, which is friends in the CIA and all these intelligence agencies, to create these reports, as we're seeing. Um, it's, it's just, it's a... It's a, it's a really dark joke, the whole thing, so mm -hmm. far. But of course, the most absurd point of this whole thing is how much the U.S. has interfered in every country's election and government in the last century, namely, as you mentioned, and I want you to go more into this, interference in the 1996, uh, what you call a stolen election, where Yeltsin took power. Talk about what the U.S. did in that election. Well, I mean, yeah, so I, I actually interviewed, you know, I did the reporting on this. Um, I interviewed... Uh, myself and Alex Zajcik, uh, the head of the OSE, OSE mission, which is the Election Observer Mission, uh, which is basically a Western uh, European-led body. He was a British MP, and he straight up said the election was stolen, it was fraudulent, and the OSE would, um, did everything to quash my report, and so it was officially known as free and fair. Um, there's fraud in every single Russian election. I mean, Fairly significant fraud by our standards, not hugely significant, let's say, by, by you know, some hardcore dictatorial standards, but, but certainly three, four, five percent, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as often stolen. And, and, and the template was really set uh, in the 1996 uh, elections that, that got Boris Yeltsin from about a three percent rating. I mean, Boris Yeltsin in his five years in office, um, you know, dragged Russia into a war in which about 100,000 people were killed and they lost. And um, the average life expectancy of a Russian male plummeted from 68 years to 56 years. Um, it had a death to birth ratio almost perhaps never seen in the 20th century, even during war times. People were just dying like flies, you know, everywhere. No state support, you know, just pure banditry, starting with Yeltsin mm -hmm. at the top all, all the way down. Um, so, you know, he had actually, you know, unlike Putin, say what you will about him, but I, I mean, I think even his enemies agree he is very popular. They, the, they might blame it on the propaganda, but he is popular. His ratings are still in the 80, you know, in the 80th percentile range, um, and he always has been popular. You know, with Yeltsin, you had to perform a miracle where this guy was absolutely hated and is still the most, one of the probably two or three most hated Russians, you know, in modern history for what he did to the country. Um, and uh, so, so it was a tough job. And, and Clinton was also running for re-election that year. 
And Clinton did not want to know, this is 1996, Clinton did not want to be known as the president who lost Russia if Yeltsin's communist opponent won. Um, so, I mean, among other things, there were American advisors, of course, advising him, but the Treasury Department, you know, we, we found out when we were reporting on this that, um, that the Treasury Department was actually drafting decrees on the, on the creation of capital markets, on the structure, the legal structure of the kind of, the structure of the economy, really. Um, 1996 also was the year that we introduced a new $100 bill for the first time. And Yeltsin's two top uh, campaign managers were, were caught by police during the campaign about a month or two before the election, carrying giant boxes, uh, Xerox boxes, full of new $100 bill notes when we were flying them in. And the Russian media was reporting at the time, I mean, the top journalists, you know, liberal journalists were reporting that, I mean, we know that stacks and stacks of $100 bills would be flown in, brought to the U.S. Embassy, and then presumably from there to the uh, central bank, but this is during the election, you know. The, um, anyway, the Russians believe, and that's what matters the most, even the liberal Russians, that we financed covertly in that way. We financed very overtly by approving more World Bank and IMF loans for Russia than any country in history at that time. Um, we, we bankrolled the whole thing. And then in the end, they still had to steal the election. So like in Chechnya, where... Again, between 50 and 100,000 people were killed there. Villages which had been wiped out voted 90, or voted actually probably 150% for Yeltsin, let's say. You know, this is, <laughs> is in Chechnya. And no one wanted to hear it, no one reported it. Um, there was some election theft in uh, 1999, 2000 when Putin won, but Putin, again, was Yeltsin's appointed successor. Mm -hmm. The people he was running against were more overtly nationalist, more overtly anti-Western. And then when Putin started, basically the first big sin that Putin committed was he didn't support the invasion of Iraq. And suddenly that's when we started to notice election fraud is a problem. <laughs>well, 1996, there was 1993, <laughs> where you <laughs> mentioned that the yeah. New York Times, as well as Bill Clinton, actually helped subvert the first democratically elected parliament. Yeah, so um, uh, Yeltsin was, there were basically two, two rival bodies that were both elected democratically in Soviet times. This is Yeltsin in the executive branch, and then the Supreme Soviet, which is the parliament, which was very powerful uh, uh, up, up until October 1993. Yeltsin had his idea of how they wanted to do privatization, which was like shock therapy, mass privatization. Yeltsin's people were directly funded by, trained by, advised by USAID by, and by Harvard. Harvard basically ran Russia's privatization program. And then it turned out that uh, the top Harvard people, Andre Schleifer and uh, Jonathan Hay, who ran the whole like, you know, setting up their capital markets, setting up their uh, privatization programs, both of them wound up eventually being um, uh, prosecuted by the Department of Justice for insider dealing. Like they would set up, uh, you know, rules for um, a mutual fund market, mm -hmm. and then they'd give no bid tenders to their wives um, to start up a fund that would get all this Russian state money. I mean, mm -hmm. they they did all this kind of insider dealing. That again, all this stuff, that, you know, we've forgotten because it didn't hurt us. But none of these people have forgotten that are in power in Russia what we did. So Yeltsin and, and, the, and the young reformers, as they were called, that were backed by the Americans had their ideas. Supreme Soviet had its ideas, which were more, I would say probably more egalitarian. They all kind of agreed that they need to bring in some market forces and some privatization and, and break up the state monopolies, but they weren't sure how. Yeltsin then decided um, that he didn't want to fight it out with uh, the parliament anymore, so he just unilaterally and illegally abolished the parliament and eventually sent in tanks and helicopters, and you know, between 500 and 1,000 people were killed. Jesus. We completely backed it up. The New York Times you know, editorials, Clinton openly backed them up, immediately sent them $10 billion more of IMF aid uh, when they did this. And you know, I was, that was right when I moved to Russia. And I, I moved about a week, I'm sorry, a month before the, uh, actually not even a month, a couple weeks before, into the same district. I mean, the bullets flying everywhere, and it was, it was pretty crazy. I watched tanks fire into the parliament building and you'd see this huge explosion go out and, and you know, the, the Americans cheered it on. And, and in fact, even a couple of Americans were killed watching that. Um, they were shooting everybody. And 
Uh, and and after, after Yeltsin succeeded in that, um, his forces succeeded in, in subduing the parliament, um, again, we backed him up, and then he had an election a couple months mm -hmm. later. They created a new constitution, and this is also really important, they created a new constitution, which vested really all power in the presidency, um, which is what allowed for Putin you know, to become as powerful as he is today. And again, we backed that up, and we and USA paid, um, you know, PR agencies like Burson Marsteller to help kind of promote uh, these referendums. The referendum on that, the referendums on uh, on the privatization vouchers. Um, I, we, we were behind everything. It was mm -hmm. essentially a colony. I, there's no other way to put it. It was like a colony of a defeated power, and we um, we screwed it up hugely. Let's talk more about the economic structure. You lived under Yeltsin for years, right after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, you described these years as a neoliberal fire sale, where Russia was essentially colonized by foreign capital. Talk specifically about what that means. In so one specific way, um, you had all these very valuable assets, as we now know, um, state oil companies, you know, some of the largest in the world. I mean, Russia has. Uh, the number one or two largest oil reserves in the world, a third of the world's natural gas, um, uh, you know, 70% of the world's um, palladium, I think, you know, a third of the world's nickel, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these industries were auctioned off in rigged auctions, which were advised by and backed by the Treasury, U.S. Treasury Department. So this is one way, you know, all, all of these state enterprises, which employed a lot of people, were sold to a handful of oligarchs um, at, you know, sometimes they didn't really even pay for them. The way they paid for them was these oligarchs owned banks, which became um, treasure, which became finance ministry or treasury vehicles. So if you needed to pay teachers and doctors, uh, the treasury didn't have a way of disseminating it, so it would disseminate through an oligarch's bank network. The oligarchs would take the money and hold up paying teachers. I mean, there were teachers, workers who weren't paid for two, three years at a time while the oligarchs took the money, spun it around. And, and you know, our advice always while this was happening was, Russia needs to tighten its belt more. Russia needs to tighten its belt more. It can't pay its teachers because it needs to tighten its belt more. Well, in fact, we were creating a, a class of international capitalists um, to, um, in the belief that if we could restructure the economy along the kind of oligarchical lines, we'd bring them into our system, they would be subordinate to us, and their natural resources would become an, basically an appendage of the Western economy. Um, that was the hope, and it did kind of go that way for a while. But it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. And, you know, we may want to roll our eyes at the 90s um, because, again, we didn't suffer then, you know. But Russians suffered enormously then and in their mind I, I honestly I'm, I'm surprised they're not more angry with us about that they seem almost more angry with us over my I didn't see the anger really explode until we bombed uh, Kosovo in 1999 then suddenly all these Russians kind of turned against us and it all kind of started to make sense to them yeah. you know um, but um, you know before then look you had the most uh, uh, equal society where the privileged people had a somewhat nicer dacha or, you know, uh, the really privileged ones maybe had a car or the super, super privileged maybe even had a car and a driver, but no one was a billionaire and there certainly weren't, you know, millions and millions of people starving in the streets or half starving in the streets. So you went from what the world's most equal society to the world's most unequal society in a very short period of time. It's incredibly traumatic, you know, and um, uh, Putin was brought in. Putin was a, when he first appeared, I mean, it was like this great relief, I think, for a lot of Russians, mm -hmm. because here was a guy who, A, didn't drink. He seemed serious, and he seemed like uh, somebody who was kind of more seriously interested in um, not doing in, not doing any more experiments on the country like the Russians kept saying like we don't want to be experimented on anymore you know and the Americans attitude was um, okay we experimented on you and you re you died on the operating table clearly it's your fault mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, we need a better patient than you um, certainly by the end of the 1990s the democracy 
is a bad word in Russia. It's just equated with stealing from everybody. Paint the everything. picture for us at the end of the 90s. What, what did life look like there? Yeah, so at the end of the 90s, I mean, look, you had the Americans and the, and the uh, you know, the international um, credit institutions like the World Bank and IMF running everything. Um, all the newspapers, all the Western media constantly cheering on Russia. It's, it's doing great. It's doing great. <laughs> it's going to do better. It's going to overcome all of its problems. And it was clearly not. The Russian press kind of knew it wasn't. And then at the end of 1998, the entire house of cards collapsed. It was at the time the greatest financial collapse, fi uh, financial markets collapse in history. The stock market fell 95 percent, 98 percent, something like that. The ruble completely collapsed. Nobody could even get money anymore. There was talk about food shortages. I think there was a time in 98, 99 when something like one third of the country um, lived on subsistence farming. Now this is a northern country where there's not much farmland. You know, w what it means is in their dachas they grew food and they needed it to supplement whatever diets they had to live. This was the result, the end result, you know, of, uh, of 10 years of us um, influencing, guiding, advising, manipulating, um, uh, you know, the, the Russian political mm -hmm. economy. So they were looking for something else. And then, as I said, in, in, in 1999, when we um, sort of unilaterally went ahead to bomb Kosovo and Yugoslavia, that was when Russians really changed. That was when a lot of them who were like, I guess you would call the kind of emerging mm -hmm. pro-Western middle class types even sort of said, Wow, maybe those those cranky old communists and nationalists were actually right about you guys all along. We're next, aren't we? You know, <laughs> they, they they got very freaked out by that. Um, uh, it was coming out that IMF money was going directly into secret bank accounts and then being kicked back to even Michelle Camdesu, who was the head of the IMF, was was implicated in uh, in getting kickbacks of money he approved to Yeltsin. I mean, it was the craziest, like, everything was stolen. Everything mm -hmm. was stolen. I wanted to briefly talk about why Yeltsin chose Putin, to, and what did he do to protect the oligarchy? Yeah, so Yeltsin was desperate. Um, he was sick. You know, he'd been pretty sick uh, since, since probably 95, 96. Um, he was surrounded by what they called the Yeltsin family clan, which were a lot of oligarchs and, and even his own family members, actually. Um, and they were all worried that should Yeltsin die, um, you know, somebody that they can't rely on may come and take power and, and prosecute them. So this is the atmosphere that Yeltsin was in in 1999. There was also going to be an election in 99, and they were starting to worry that if they were to lose the election, or they didn't have a, a strong successor or even prime minister to, to see Yeltsin, that they were all gonna go down. And it was a legitimate worry. Mm -hmm. The mayor of Moscow was turned against them. Parts of the, uh, of the deep state were turning against Yeltsin. And Yeltsin had named Vladimir Putin um, as his head of, of the FSB, the intelligence agency, uh, in late 98, I think it was, in, in the middle of 1998, and he was proving very trustworthy and loyal. Um, as head of the FSB, he was, Putin was starting to do what he could to protect Yeltsin, and when the general prosecutor started uh, opening up cases against Yeltsin family, clan, uh, uh, members for theft of state, state property, uh, Putin arranged um, filming uh, the, the general prosecutor, who would be like our attorney general, uh, having sex with two prostitutes, <laughs> put it on television. <laughs> like Yeltsin saw that and said, this is my man, and he's, you know, he's going to protect me. Yeah. During the Yeltsin era, there was countless um, assassinations of journalists, of political dissidents, right? This, this was going on in conjunction with this horrific um, time of inequality and, and um, you know, joblessness and, and everything like that. Why didn't the U.S. care about press freedoms in Russia <laughs> then, like it does now? I, you know, again, because it was a vassal state. It mm -hmm. wasn't a threat. It was a vassal state. And what we really cared about was... Um, it's beyond, it was keeping Russia as weak as possible and um, uh, getting access to the resources and, and the enormous resources, not just in Russia, but in the Caspian Sea, 
countries, uh, Azerbaijan, um, Kazakhstan, uh, Turkmenistan, um, we, we wanted those resources, so we'd, we'd you know, uh, give them a free pass as long as we could get a hold of the loot there. Um, but no, it's a, it's a good point. Look, when I got there, uh, shortly after I got there, one of the most popular young Russian journalists, um, Dima Kholodov, so this is 1994, he was investigating Yeltsin's really powerful defense minister for uh, a, one of the big Russian dailies, Moscow Komsomolets. And his sources, he was publishing some pretty sensational stuff about really appalling uh, um, corruption that was going on that, that the defense minister was responsible for. Yeltsin knew about it. And so they set him up and they said, you know, there's a briefcase full of these like sensational documents and this, you're going to be an even bigger star. They had a very, very vibrant, open, wild press at this time in Russia, way freer than ours in terms of the range and the aggressiveness mm -hmm. of the media, you know, towards power. Holodov got the briefcase, opened it up, um, and killed him, blew him up. Um, everybody in the media called out Yeltsin, how could you not fire your defense minister? Everybody knows this is what happened. Uh, but again, you know, this is a question of heating rods. Like, um, we kept saying, well, if, if we weaken Yeltsin in any way, the communists could come to power, you know? So we got to keep our criticism quiet. Um, and we did this over and over and over, journalist after journalist, opposition figure after opposition figure, people being killed left and right. We just said, no, to talk about it is to destabilize Yeltsin. To destabilize Yeltsin means bringing back the communists. And so we have to keep our mouths shut. By the time I started the exile in 1997 with Matt Taibbi, the Russian media had been, it went through its first consolidation. Basically, it was all pretty free before and very wild and, and unruly. Um, during the election that was stolen by Yeltsin in 1996, the American advisors, if you go back through their notes, they advised Yeltsin to consolidate all the television media um, under his own wing so that it became one state media, including what people thought was the independent media, and to hand, you know, hand out favors to these people and advise them to lie. Um, so they created this reality during the 1996 campaign that if the communists win, I mean, it was propaganda nonstop on television. It would show people on hanging from lampposts and, you know, people in gulags. And, all. And, and, and then after Yeltsin won, the complete oligarchization of Russia meant that the entire media after that was, as one of the favors, handed all the press. So mm -hmm. this oligarch had this newspaper, this television, uh, you know, network, and, and this whatever. And then they, so they all, all journalists at that point suddenly worked for oligarchs. And again, remember, this was, Russia at this time was the focus of the empire. It was, a, it was our number one colony, and it was the project, you know, of the century for the American kind of empire. Right. It's like the Red Scare, except there's no Reds, right? I know. <laughs> Russia's capitalist. It's an oligarchy. Um, we collaborated on that front. What is the threat today that Russia poses to the U.S. empire that is causing this insane hysteria and aggression? We got very used after the uh, end of the Cold War to being able to do whatever we wanted, wherever we wanted. And the only thing holding us back was our own, you know, amazing sense of justice or whatever. <laughs> but no, there was no countervailing power. <clears throat> and like what we've seen in Syria, where Russia went in and had a, actually a much more strategically coherent objective, which was back the government, back the government uh, and their forces, um, and they succeeded. And that's just, that alone is, is very deeply threatening to people who are used to having their own way. Mm -hmm. It's a threat to, you know, uh, full spectrum dominance, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. Uh, so I guess it's, it's a threat on that level. Um, Mark, you have many contacts still on the ground in Russia. What is their reaction to this? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm noticing not only my contacts, but regular people and, and like, um, Russian opposition to Putin people, they're all very weirded out by this. They, at first, I kind of, I, I think they were sort of amused. And as it's gone on and on, and they're realizing, like, we're starting to expel, you know, and, and we're not releasing any intelligence, and there's clearly so much BS around this whole uh, R Russia scare. They're, they're going more silent now. They're genuinely weirded out. They may be, there, there was schadenfreude for a while, but I think the schadenfreude is kind of turning into a, a dread of like, what is this 
really mean? How crazy are we and how far are we going to go? Um, Trump's coming to power. I think people have a far too rosy, hopeful view of how much things might change under him. I would imagine they're not going to be as hostile for, relations won't be as hostile for at least, you know, six months or something, but God knows after that. Let's talk about Trump, because everyone paints Trump as best friends with Putin, right? <clears throat> um, but given Trump's fragile ego and the people he's surrounding himself with that all want war with Iran, how quickly could this change? Um, yeah, no, it, it could change easily. And I, I would like to add, too, that I, I think if you look at it, Trump is, Trump, Trump, I'm sure he probably does see, you know, like some things about Putin. He's a mensch or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's a tough guy. Um, but I think Trump is also, let's, let's not assume he's a complete loony idiot. Let's assume that he actually is fairly smart and won the presidency. And he knew what he was doing by baiting the Hillary Democrats and baiting journalists by playing around with how much of a, a friend he might have been with Putin. Because what did that do during the election? It got everybody chasing Kremlin phantoms into a cul-de-sac when, you know, this guy has more skeletons in his closet than anybody <laughs> in history. I, I, I mean, he's a mobster, you know? He's, he's uh, the, the bigotry, like everything that Trump has on his record and everybody decided let's run against Putin. So I think, again, the danger is really on our side. And I can easily imagine a lot of dangers. Like, for example, not just if Putin does something that crosses Trump and crosses Trump's ego, but more like Trump, look, Trump has a kind of a populist instincts mm -hmm. and, 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 and his instincts also go towards what's going to make him more powerful and what's going to make him popular. And if he realizes working in that DC bubble that actually being the guy who used to be, so imagine the credibility like in, in the PR world. I was the guy who was most friendly with him, and he still turned against me. Like, imagine what a mouthpiece he could be for a new Cold War. It's very easy to imagine um, things getting hostile again between the yeah, Trump administration and, and the Kremlin and heating up in crazy ways that, you know, we probably don't want to think about.